Okay, we are live. Welcome everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you for joining us for the EdTech Vertical where we have an exciting panel with our industry trailblazers and subject matter experts. My name is Lana Al-Attar, I'm the CEO of Good Juju. It's a digital experience agency and I'll be your moderator for the session. I'd love to introduce you to my fellow panelists for the EdTech session. Uh, we have with us today, Dr. Sheikha Fay bint Abdullah Al Khalifa, who is the director of eLearning Center at the University of Bahrain, that is our national university. She both leads the teams and plays an active role in managing the digital transformation process uh, throughout the whole COVID-19 pandemic. We have Sheikha Latifa Al Khalifa, who is a social entrepreneur. I love that. STEAM education advocate, co-founder and CEO of Clever Play, which is a multi-award-winning purpose-driven startup. Very excited to have you. And we have Ms. Shireen Yaqub, the, C, uh, the CEO of EDROC, which is an initiative of Queen Rania Foundation. EDROC is the Arab world's leading open online education platform. I am subscribed to you. <laughs> And finally, we have Ms. Amira al kabeti which is a co-founder of Al-Rawi Media. And Al-Rawi is an innovative and award-winning audiobook application specialized in Arabic books. I am also subscribed to. Um, I'm very excited to have this panel and I would love to start off with a really interesting statistic that I found online. Did you know that according to the Global Ed Tech Market Report in 2021, it predicts that the global ed tech market was valued around $85 billion in just 2021. And that is expected to reach approximately $218 billion in 2027. That being said, <laughs> those are big numbers. I'm sure you'll agree that we're in for an interesting session. And so we begin. All right, so this question is for Dr. Sheikha Fay Al Khalifa and Sheikha Latifa. A year and a half into the pandemic, what lessons were learned from the quick response? And how has that restructured long term strategies for educational resilience? Dr. Sheikha Fay? Thank you, Lena. Um, I think um, I'll go back to the statistic that you've just mentioned about the market share of the edtech. Um, basically now in the pandemic and how it changed throughout the pandemic. Uh, I'll just um, briefly say that the game has tremendously changed from 2019 to uh, 2020. I remember in 2019, we were meeting with edtech companies to basically use their services for the university back then. And we wanted, we wanted to scale up and increase our usage from um, 400 classes being online to 1,000 classes being online. Little did we know that within one year, we would have to go completely online <laughs> within two weeks. So uh, the game changed from them coming to us offering their services. It became us institutions going to ed tech companies begging for their services because we couldn't operate without them. So yes, I do agree there's a huge game change in the ed tech uh, sector. I would think uh, back to your question, the most important two things that we need to pay attention to and lessons learned from this is first of all, to have a very strong infrastructure uh, because without an infrastructure in place that enables us to basically operate our contingency plan in case of whether natural disasters or you know, health disasters like we had with the COVID, simply education cannot happen. So the number one most important thing that we have learned that we have to really invest in infrastructure. Before the pandemic, investing in ed tech and infrastructure that allows us to do that was uh, voluntarily. And if we had it was okay, it's a plus. If we didn't have it, that's still okay, we can still teach. Um, on campus and continue our processes. But when now we understand that um, times come when if you don't have the right infrastructure, simply put, there will be no education. So that's something that we need to pay attention to. I'll leave the floor for Sheikh al to perhaps maybe give her insight on this. Sure, thank you very much. And I'm very excited to be here. Uh, you know, I think you 
pretty much segued really nicely to build on what you've said, because I completely agree with everything that you've said. I think the reality is this, right? You know, we're talking about nearly 1.6 billion children and youth uh, being completely disrupted from education due to COVID in 2020 and 2021. Now, the plus point is that, you know, COVID really shook that belief that we had previously about education, you know, really showcasing that learning can occur anywhere at any time, and that education systems are not too heavy to move at all, you know, in, in retrospect. So I think that in and of itself, I think is a fantastic, uh, you know, wake up call for everyone that, hey, by the way, like this thing that we thought that is going to, is never going to change, uh, or, or that might just incrementally progress over time, that it actually was able to uh, very, very quickly. So that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is that we definitely need to build on this momentum. It's not enough for us to say that this has happened and to stop here. We need to build on the momentum that has already, you know, that, that has already started, and we need to accelerate it and drive education into a new and better normal. So if I were to put like, you know, pinpoint my three, let's say, top uh, takeaways from COVID, and I'm looking at it primarily from, you know, private as, you know, we're, we're a private startup, as you said, you know, we're a small private company. And so the way that I would look at this is in three uh, lessons, so to speak. The first one, as I mentioned, that, you know, education is actually uh, not too heavy to move at all, you know, so we learned that it can actually happen, it can move online, and it took, as, you know, Shafai said, literally weeks, not months and years. Um, so that's the first thing. The second one I would say is that you know deep global disruption emphasizes the need for greater resilience. And by this I mean, you know, we do need to build on this infrastructure to be able to actually build for it, for, you know, for generations to come for the future. Uh, and what's important about this is that the only way that you actually have a proper infrastructure or let's say a resilient system is that it will give you an opportunity to go ahead and disrupt. Without it, you won't be able to. The last one is, is, is really my, my favorite takeaway of, of COVID 2020, uh, 2020, 2021, 2022. You know, we're still in this. So hopefully, we're, you know, we're looking for brighter days ahead. But, you know, what came, you know, what came is maybe a surprise to many. For me, it was a fantastic learning opportunity and that learning in and of itself is a relational and social process. So what we realized with COVID is that, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of whether you are learning in a classroom or you're learning at home, learning happens everywhere. And so in a way, we have transformed education away from just, you know, your typical, you know, classrooms and walls into learning spaces everywhere. It's about, you know, building that mindset. It's about, it's about transforming learning spaces to, you know, making sure that education and learning um, is, is, is all around us. So those are my three big uh, takeaways from, from, uh, from COVID. I absolutely love that. It segues perfectly into my next question. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> learning happens everywhere now because I mean I guess it has happened that way before in the past but now more obviously so uh, and, and and more structured so I will be asking I'm curious to know how have the workplaces view of skills acquired online post pandemic changed and if there are any advantages to online credentials let's start off with uh, Shireen Thank you, Lana. Very happy to be with uh, the distinguished panelists here and yourself. Uh, this is such a timely and relevant topic to discuss. Um, and I'm very happy to see all these women engaged in this uh, ecosystem. Uh, and I can't uh, admire enough Latifa's uh, shirt, the future is female, uh, pretty much reflects the ethos of uh, the form that brings us together. So back to your question, Lana, um, I think that, you know, We've already been seeing some acceleration in uh, the digital disruptions that happen, but with the pandemic, with COVID-19, we're now looking at double disruption, right? Where we see that um, technology adoption is now becoming part and parcel of our lives. And like uh, Sheikh Hafez was saying, little did we know 
back uh, or two years uh, ago that just in few months, everybody will have to go online. So similarly with the ecosystem, um, with higher education and also uh, the workplace, we are also seeing this shift in terms of recognizing the importance of both online skillings and uh, the credentials earned online. Um, we see uh, companies like Google, for example, launching uh, the Google certificate programs that are becoming very popular and gaining traction. And we see that these programs are working. For example, 80% of those enrolled in these programs report positive career outcomes, whether it's a job or a raise or a promotion. And uh, Google is not alone. IBM, uh, Facebook, Salesforce, Microsoft are also uh, joining forces. And this signals that, you know, um, we are making the shift and this is here to stay. We're just now looking into how do we develop the ecosystem in a way that allows for rapid skilling in high demand uh, areas where you know, the shelf life of a skill is now becoming shorter and shorter. And uh, you, know, you need to have a combination of both technical and I don't wanna call them soft skills anymore, power skills uh, that can make you more competitive in the uh, workplace. Online education or learning provides flexibility. It allows you to overcome barriers related to mobility, uh, time constraints, a lot of times also uh, allows for affordable solutions that uh, can make life-changing education more accessible. So if we look at the future of jobs report that the web has published at the end of 2020, we see that 50% of the workforce or employees in general need to reskill. And even those who remain in the same job, uh, around 40% of their skill set need to change. So employers in the workplace is rapidly realizing that through online learning, you can accelerate this process because it needs to be done at scale. And um, you know the typical model of fixed four year or two, uh, four year college degree or four, uh, two year master's program is no longer the only way. And universities themselves are engaging uh, creatively and innovatively in creating solutions on this front. So I think the, uh, the future is very bright on that front. And we're seeing this shift that allows us to create an ecosystem that works collectively to give and recognize these credentials. And we're seeing also an uptake among uh, youth and um, uh, students who are uh, starting to realize that uh, there's a lot to gain. Uh, obviously, we talk a lot about the digital divide and how now uh, access to a reliable and uh, suitable internet connection is nothing less than a human right. Uh, so this also requires a lot of public private uh, partnerships, engagement of donors, civil society, uh, and pretty much all stakeholders to push the envelope uh, forward on this front. I love that. It's uh, it's all about agile learning, if I may, you know, uh, learning on the go. And again, back to infrastructure, I think in Bahrain, we're really lucky and blessed because uh, we have like one of the highest internet penetration rates in the world. Uh, so it's probably a point that we take for granted, but yes, definitely, again, infrastructure. I'm curious to know on the same point as well from uh, Dr. Sheikha Latifa, uh, sorry, Faye, uh, because uh, you are in university and I was curious to know, like, what is the perception of the online degrees that they get from, from now the university? Is it, is it the same? Uh, do you see any, any interesting trends? All right, thank you very much. Actually, I'd like to, um, to say that I like very much what Shireen has touched upon about being, instead of being soft skills, what we knew previously at soft skills, they're becoming power skills. I, can, I think that's something that I'm gonna use in the future. Thank you, Shireen, for that. Yeah, I do agree. Um, now, to think about it, uh, just before COVID, online certificates were not accepted in Bahrain. Um, someone cannot get a fully online degree. Ironically, the, everyone else is now learning online. Everyone in Bahrain is learning online. So, you know, the perception has changed. And I do agree, there's, there's a huge need to shift not only the skill sets, but 
let us remember that we are preparing students now for jobs that don't exist yet because the market is changing dramatically and in a very fast pace that we are now educating them in those four-year degrees in something that perhaps upon graduation will not exist anymore and will not be needed anymore. So we need to be much more flexible about the skills that we... Um, I'm sorry, there's a back noise. I don't know if um, you're hearing it too, or is it just me? It, it's just you. Maybe try turning your mic Okay. Off. No, that's fine. So, yeah, I was saying, so um, basically the whole idea of skills that needs to change um, and be updated at a much faster pace than what we have now because those this four years uh, degree plus two for a master's or sometimes one in a master is not really fast enough for the for the changing pace of skill sets that are needed uh, so yeah I do agree um, and uh, again back to what Shireen has said about uh, having access to internet is actually a human right now. And I do agree, we're lucky in Bahrain, we have a very small geographic area and all of us are condensed in one uh, place in Bahrain, in the northern part of Bahrain, which gives us um, a competitive edge. And also in addition to that, um, we do have a reliable um, internet infrastructure in Bahrain uh, that allows us to really depend on online learning and uh, online workforce uh, in the future. I just want to say one last point here. Um, we, we do understand that there is a great potential in online learning and online working or working from home uh, distance, uh, being in a distance from the office. But uh, this does not, of course, eliminate the need to be um, in the place and have one-to-one -one face uh, face to face interaction. Perhaps maybe Sheikh Al Atifa could uh, could add more to that. But I've seen uh, lately, basically, that um, a lot of people are are suffering from from being distant for so long uh, from the workplace. So I think the future is not really to depend on online learning or online workforce forever or completely is to really have that flexibility that that we have seen with introducing work from home uh, scenarios and introducing online learning. So I think the future is hybrid rather than in one of the others. And this is what this is the takeaway from COVID. This is what we're learning, that we need to be more flexible. We need to be much faster in adopting and we need to be hybrid in the nature of the work that we do. Actually, I, I really do agree on that point. It's kind of like the black swan. So COVID was that black swan. And then I guess an internet outage would be the other black swan that we'd be waiting for. So it would have to be a uh, hybrid. But I'm also curious to know uh, Latifa, uh, Sheikh Latifa's uh, chime in on the matter, if you may. <laughs> yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so the I'm going to approach it from the way that we looked at it, right, which was that we ran our business uh, offline at, before COVID, you know, and uh, when COVID hit, we transitioned to completely online. Now, you know, we deal directly with children. And so we were able to very quickly, you know, uh, run our programs online without really a massive disruption there. It was very, very quick, uh, the way that we did it, you know, because the infrastructure was there and, and all that. Now, what we've noticed, though, is that, you know, at the end of the day, as I said in my, you know, in, in my first uh, segment on answering that question, which was that learning is a social experience. Now, I definitely believe that there's a lot of value in, you know, especially with children, you know, because they are building these fundamental skills. So, of course, being together, they're building their social skills or their power skills as well. So that in and of itself is hugely, hugely valuable. Now, how do you translate that to online? That's where sometimes the disconnect happens, right? And, and that's what we need to be aware of. So this is to say that I've seen good and bad examples, right? I've seen terrible examples, but I've seen equally, honestly, equally really good examples of how, that, how it could work. The thing that we have to understand, though, is that for us to take learning online and to make it actually effective is to understand that there, it's, at the end of the day, it's a medium and it's how you use it. And so, yes, it's important for you to be able to give you know, children an opportunity to be you know, together. So that's, you know, going back to your question, absolutely, there is so much value in that. And then there's so much value in, in 
you know, the other learning that happens, you know, that's not, let's say that you might not classify, you know, as, as, as learning, but that's so much that's actually happening, you know, between the interactions between the kids and all that, that they take away from that interaction. But as I said, you know, there is so much value in online done right, done, done right. And I think, you know, I think that one of the questions will really talk about this. So I don't know whether or not you want me to delve into it right now, or, um, you know, wait for when, you know, when uh, you come full circle, but I'm happy to, you know, to, to jump if you prefer that I uh, well, do it now or just wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I just add to what uh, Sheikh al has just uh, said about online learning done right? I'll just give an example of what was happening at the university. So at the beginning of the pandemic, when we moved everyone online, there was no direction whether people are supposed to open their cameras during lectures or are not supposed to open their cameras. And same for instructors. So some instructors um, have asked the students to do so, to open their cameras and others didn't. And I'm teaching, so I've tried both, and I must say that now I ask my students not only to open their cameras, but I make sure that I say hello to each and every student in the class at the beginning of the class. Sometimes it takes me a long time because in some of the classes I have about 40 students, but I still do it because I notice that there's a huge impact on how the students are learning and how they are interacting in the class with me. Um, there's a, a lot deal of online uh, screen burnout that happens when you're interacting uh, without having the camera on, without having a conversation with your instructor and without, you know, it's, it's not a YouTube video that you're watching. It's supposed to be a one-to-one -one lecture or one-to-others lecture where people are interacting to other. One of the great challenges, I'll add to what uh, Sheikh al has said, to how to move on-site to online is students interacting together. We, we tend to do that with breakout groups and so on, but it's ab absolutely different than actually just turning your head and talking to the colleague next to you. You can do that while the teacher is talking in normal classes, but you can't really do that online, which is really a challenge. So I, I would still believe that there are aspects of physical present on campus learning that cannot be compensated online. But online learning and online work in that sense is also important because it shows us that in scenarios where we cannot be in the office, things do not stop. So it is a great tool for continuity uh, in cases like such are the circumstances that we're going through now. Sorry if I've taken so long. I just wanted no, to add. All. Actually, that is really interesting, a very interesting topic that you An interesting statistic where um, I was uh, reading uh, people learn better sometimes even with the online learning, especially with pre-recorded because they can control the speed at which they can play back and therefore consume more knowledge uh, at a pace that is uh, applicable to them, which is really interesting. So speaking about doing online learning correctly, Amira, I have a question for you. You are part of the representation today, which had a first mover advantage in terms of online pre-COVID times, because your application for reading online books has been there way before COVID, and that's fantastic. Can you let us know, what was, what was part of that success? Like, how did you reach out to your audience successfully, and how did, how did you make it work? Um, hi, everyone, first. Uh, let me give you a brief about uh, Arawi. Arawi is a socio-cultural platform that enables uh, the creations and distribution of Arabic audiobooks. Uh, we made our research and we see that there is a 4 uh, million, 420 million Arabic speakers. Uh, so since the beginning, um, Arawi teams make sure that works to make sure that every individual individuals can access this knowledge through Arawi, everywhere, anywhere, uh, just as simple as uh, click the button. We, may, we make sure um, that it is easy uh, to be accessed. We work with our strategic partners uh, to create and distribute this knowledge. We're on board of uh, Emirates Airline and Gulf Airline before the pandemic, and we were also on, on other channels. Uh, through COVID, uh, of course, um, we stopped because the airline stopped. So we tried uh, to distribute through other channels. 
um, also people start to looking and start using the internet and looking for books. So we were in YouTube. We put, we put a lot of you in uh, books on YouTube for free. So people, we have a lot of audience come through a YouTube channels. Also, we worked with our partner, Muhammad bin Rashid Al Maktoum Foundation and uh, Dubai, uh, sorry, Abu Dhabi Culture and Tourism uh, to give the audience and the individuals free access to our library for three months in 2020 was from April to July. So we had a rush also from that. We also worked with Arab Youth Center and uh, Emirate, uh, which they distribute free subscriptions to, you, to youth from, 30, from 15 to 35 uh, ages. Um, and uh, that's it with, with our partnerships we, uh, we access and people start using the internet through the pandemic. That's, that's amazing. I mean, I remember when I read the news about uh, getting the contract on Emirates, I was so happy and so impressed. I was already a very big fan of your product, a, a Bahraini startup that had that much potential and that many books in Arabic, which I occasionally used to try and improve my own. <laughs> so uh, partnerships is everything, but also an interesting flip on the pandemic where uh, your partners with the airline industry, but then with the pandemic, it yeah, that's interesting. But I'm glad that you've come full circle and and partnered with other people. So fantastic! Yeah. I forgot to mention that we are now in Sudan through a different channel that than uh, Arawi, but uh, because they don't have access to credit cards and this thing, so, so we contribute with different channel there uh, to, to distribute the box there. That's interesting, actually. Um, uh, again, coming back to having the right infrastructure in order to uh, facilitate that kind of learning. Has that been challenging or has the reception been good in Sudan? Very good. Uh, actually, we have a 90 countries uh, and, and uh, sub subscribe to our uh, to Rawi. That's fantastic. Great. I think yeah. some might say Rawi was there before the podcast boom here in the region, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And I, I, I sometimes hear like references, you know, to it, which is really interesting. So pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to go back to infrastructure. And um, I know we've touched a uh, base on this, but uh, I, I wanted to just have a final chime in, if I may, on how resilient the current education system is if it moves online completely. Because I think, is a university still practicing a semi-hybrid or is it totally online? Uh, yes, well, I, I was hoping everyone would come back to the campus so that, uh, you know, a little bit of burden will be lifted from my shoulders, but uh, Unfortunately, we had the Omicron variant and everyone went back online. So things are still online at the university for the majority of the classes. So yeah, I'd, um, I'd, I'd think, let me just comment on that infrastructure part, um, Lena. I, I think infrastructure is not only the physical infrastructure or what we mean by infrastructure in the, in the technology sense, but also social infrastructure, um, which I mean, you know, our faculty and students being adaptable to change and having the skills to actually teach online and learn online. Uh, what I've noticed uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, a um, few funny stories from when we started um, teaching online, we were giving those all of those training courses to instructors. And of course, we have those, um, you know, literature courses where the instructors just used to talk to the students in the class, no PowerPoint slides, nothing. They had a textbook and we would just talk to the students during the class. So suddenly they had to come online and use the tools and use all of the functions in the computer. And, you know, we have different generations of full professors at the university, and some of them are just used to, you know, whiteboard or chalkboards, you know, where to present to students and to explain things. And things were pretty tough. In one of the training sessions, one of the professors said to us, I'm still trying to turn on my computer. And you're teaching me about this learning management system and that learning management system, how to do exams online and so on. So 
the learning curve that everyone went at is, is tremendously steep. And we, we need to keep going that direction because things are changing. You know, every day they open the learning management system and there's something completely new. So social capabilities need to cope with the advancement in technologies. And um, coming back to power skills, what Shireen have said, Love that. Uh, this, this is a power skill now to be able to learn how to change fast and learn how to adapt fast, no matter how old you are, no matter how from what generation you are coming. Um, I'd, I'd just give some credit to also our senior professors at the university as well. Some of them were, um, on the contrary, very excited about teaching online. And in those courses where you had to actually explain things like mathematical equations or things that are written down, uh, we've had people calling up and saying, oh, which iPad should I buy? Which pen does goes with which iPad so that I can contact the student, you know, and draw for them or, you know, write equations and so on. So we've had people who are really agile and really adaptable to change. And on the contrary, we've had people who are resistant to change. And I think this is this was one of the biggest obstacles, you know, the, this resistance to change. Uh, and this happens whenever you have any new uh, technologies. So now whenever we change the softwares or we change the learning management system, we always have those new ad fast adopters to change. Uh, you know, the, like those people who buy the latest iPhone and run to buy it and they want to, you know, get into the latest technologies and learn. And there are those who just want others to use it first, tell them what's bad, what's good, whether to buy it or not. You know, things, things like that. So I think adaptability to change is very important. It's, it's a lesson to, to be taking. So I'd like to think of infrastructure as more of the social and physical infrastructure. That is, uh, that is so true. Um, Sheikha Latifa, what about on, on your end? Completely online, are we ready? So I'm going to look at it from a different lens. And, you know, the way that I look at it is I'm a, I'm a natural optimist. And I think that we're undergoing this whole radical reimagining of, of education, which is super, super exciting for me. Um, and, you know, we're, we're in the early childhood education space. So that's, that's even fantastic because, you know, you're talking about fundamental uh, learning that happens, like, you know, giving them really the base, the foundation uh, and, and build from there. But uh, I would have to say one thing, first before you know I segue into your question which is that at the end of the day when we're talking about you know this radical reimagining and what what this what could this mean it's very important for us to start from a place that's completely new and not build on existing structures that have long proved to have not served students. I think that's really, really important because what ends up happening usually is you say, all right, well, what do we currently have and how can we make it better? So instead of you know building on what is already existing, it's actually, you know, it's more effective. And, and that's where we should be at and thinking, you know, along those lines of, well, what if we don't use what is currently existing and, and try to reimagine what it could look like without it, if that makes sense. So, you know, that's kind of how, how I look at infrastructure and how it can be reimagined. I'm going now, to chime in here. Uh, yeah, on go ahead. It, it's like we say, uh, had you asked people back in the day what they wanted, they would pro probably have said a faster horse instead of a car. So I think that's, that sums it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, at the end of the day, like it can be incremental or it can be, you know, uh, exponential. And, uh, and the, with the rate of, you know, where, we're, where we would like to go, uh, I think, you know, exponential is definitely, you know, the way to go uh, personally. But I, I do have to say that at the end of the day, for, to make it work, there's so much that still needs to happen. Right. And the way that I look at it is from three buckets. Who, how and what. So when we talk about who, we're talking about these educators, teachers, who, as you've mentioned, you know, you've pinpointed some of the challenges and, you know, uh, my fellow panelists have also done the same in saying that, you know, they need to acquire new skills to be able to, you know, stay abreast of everything that's currently happening, making sure that, you know, they are digitally, you know, uh, fluent and, and, you know, can, can navigate the changes that are coming their way. So that's the first thing. It's, it's really about redefining the role of the teacher today. The role of the teacher, you know, in a normal classroom differs completely from the role of the teacher online. 
And this is something that I touched on, you know, when I saw good and bad examples, because if you're of the mindset that, okay, the way that it worked previously in a classroom, and you're going to just, you know, do the same online, then you are completely ineffective. I'm of the view, personally, that facilitators and teachers and educators are, for lack of a better word, they have to also be entertainers in a sense, because education and entertainment really goes hand in hand for effective education, right? You know, when you, I've seen it with kids, like we, we deal with children, but very, just to be quite frank, it's something that I see myself, you know, and, and the way that I learn. The more fun I have, the more fun about, you know, I, the more fun I have with the material, I'm more effective in learning it. And so it's the same with children. Uh, and, and again, this is, this is very much research backed. But the point being is that the facilitator or the teacher or the educator is a facil facilitator of learning, right? That's their job. That's what they're there to do, to facilitate the learning process. And so that being done online requires completely different mindset, first and foremost, you know, and then the skill set. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is so that's the, the, the who the how is the medium that we talked about. Now, for me, technology is just a tool. Right. It's how you use the tool that, that can actually make the difference. And so I've seen good and bad examples of this again. You know, jumping on Zoom. Is that the perfect usage of, 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 of Zoom? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, if you're just sitting there and just doing it as a lecture, not really, not very effective. I've sat through one. Terrible versus you know the way that we do it especially with children is that we it's completely gamified it's completely interactive you know our facilitators are in their screens pretty much assisting them you know they're drawing on each other's screens they're you know they're using a lot of um, you know uh, websites that get get them to you know to rate polls and so you can see live engagement happening in real time versus you know like this passive um, messaging, for example, or, you know, usage of emojis to dictate, you know, where you are or things of that nature. So there are definitely ways in which you can use technology tools that are currently available and many of them for free to enhance the learning process online. So that's, we touched on the who, we touched on the how. Now we need to touch on the what. And the what is the content, it's the meat. You know, if we're talking about a burger, so we touched on, you know, the, the bun, we touched on, you know, the, the, the top bun, bottom bun, and now it's the beef, right? And, and the beef is the content. How do you make the content work for online? Again, very, very different to, you know, keeping the content, you know, the same kind of content that you use offline and, and just, you know, um, scan or have a digitized, digitized version of the book online. It requires a, a complete rethink of the content and really a well thought out learning experience that we don't usually talk about. At the end of the day, when we, when we want learning to be transformative, we, we have to reverse engineer the entire process and we have to understand where do we wanna to go to and what's the kind of experience we want to create? And really, it's only when you start with the end in mind that you can actually start putting these things in place, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you so much for bringing that around. Okay. So we've, we've talked about this um, innovation of like how we deliver the sessions and different ways of doing things. So I'm gonna segue right now into uh, a question for Shireen. Uh, technology has been evolving at an exponential rate. Combined with the acceleration done by COVID, older jobs are becoming redundant, as you've mentioned, giving rise to the need for upskilling in order to satisfy the demand to fill new jobs. I'd like an overview for the upskilling market and how you are tackling upskilling. Thank you. Um, so I, I think I touched a bit upon this uh, when I was sharing, so I'm not going to repeat the examples, but I just want to emphasize that there is this 
uh, rise in micro credentials, alternative credentials. Uh, and we are seeing the infrastructure and ecosystem evolve as more players um, engage with uh, this transition into a new era of how do we really measure what matters and ensure that people are job ready, right? So we're seeing that um, the, the skills are becoming the currency of the labor market. Um, online credentialing is providing the flexibility, the connection to industry to understand what's needed at the same time rapidly uh, enabling higher ed uh, players to provide uh, programs and um, credentials that can really assist uh, both uh, the, the job seekers and also employers to fulfill their needs, right? So right now we're seeing that the global companies offering ed tech solutions are rapidly working with various partners innovatively, whether it's like uh, universities or companies or even practitioners on creating these micro-credentials. Other companies are on the rise like Credly to help verify that a skill uh, was pretty much gained in a certain area. And then it allows you to create a profile where you can stack these credentials, demonstrate your capabilities to uh, employers, save them as part of your uh, profile. Um, especially now with also the rise of the gig economy, we're seeing more of uh, freedom in, in the sense of how people actually monetize what they know and what jobs they can do, uh, primarily through the skills they have. And I'd like to emphasize again that it's not just cloud computing, AI, e-commerce, big data that we're talking about here. We're also talking about critical thinking, um, problem solving, because as machine learning and AI gets more advanced, we also need uh, more human skills to be uh, properly mastered. So in terms of the marketplace, we're seeing this rise, this um, uh, huge investments we hear about all the time. Uh, just recently, edX had its exit uh, with an 800 million deal with 2U. Uh, to uh, uh, that was really like a, a, a monumental uh, moment for the ed tech space. So uh, for us, for example, at Idrak, as we start building more and more skilling programs online, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to map out the needs uh, that are marked with by the industry. Uh, what are the jobs that are available? Where is the skill gap? Uh, and the skill gap has been accelerated by COVID-19 uh, in addition to the fourth industrial revolution, of course. So we're trying to see, okay, so what are the needs? Who are the personas we're trying to serve? What are the contexts of these personas? Where can we meet them where they are? How can we customize the learning experiences, let's see if I've mentioned, uh, to suit their needs? Because it's not just like a broadcast of uh, theories and content anymore. That doesn't cut it. You need to make sure that you have uh, a learning experience that's properly engineered, pedagogically driven, but also uh, engaging, gamified, uh, chunked in a way that, you know, attends to all cognitive load theory uh, practices. And at the end of the day, you need to engineer the, um, the program in a way that can prove that there, there was a transfer or an acquiring of a, a competency or a skill, and then also provide the uh, earners of these credentials with something tangible that they can showcase, use to showcase to employers to signal their capability of doing something, especially when we talk about uh, entry-level jobs. So for example, in the skilling programs we are uh, now offering, we just launched a micro-credential in uh, full stack web development and the uptake we have seen is just incredible. Uh, I mean, within three days, we had around 10,000 applications, um, which signals how hungry and ready Arab youth are uh, for such opportunities, especially when they are delivered online. So uh, back to what I was saying, you, you really need to also include hands-on projects capstone projects where they apply what they learn, they provide uh, some sort of a proof of the skills they have gained. 
and also to enable the creation of these communities of practice where through this network you have access to mentors, connections, uh, people who are passionate about the same, the same topic who can help each other grow and evolve or refer each other to opportunities and engage in different projects. Absolutely, I totally agree. I think we had this discussion, uh, uh, I think a couple of days ago, where we were saying that I had actually learned all my programming online through similar programs to Edrock. So I do do full stack development. And, and then uh, again, seconding your point on community, I also do run the largest tech community in Bahrain with 2,800 developers, the Google Developer Group Manama. Community is so important when it comes to the assimilation of uh, uh, like information. And, and I'm curious to know, is that the same in the other, uh, you know, subsectors, uh, Latifa, Sheikha Khalif, uh, Sheikha Fay, and Amira, do you feel the same way when it comes to communities? We can start with Sheikha Fay. Yes, of course. Um, I think it's the same um, in, in all aspects. Um, you know, talking about micro credentials, um, even even the ability to back back to teaching online and the difference between teaching online and teaching on site. Uh, Sheikh Al Khalifa have touched upon um, how different it is, um, and this is a new set of skills that everyone should acquire who who is currently teaching. You can't just expect to come and teach online the same ways that you used to teach uh, on site, and these are new sets of skills that are acquired online using micro credentials and things that you you know um, things that you would want to develop yourself uh, being part of so yeah designing your courses to be able to put them online in a way that is engaging to students is something that the educational sector should really look at and all educators should really uh, equip themselves with uh, in, in the sense of micro credentials so there are a lot of platforms who are providing such uh, courses for educators to develop themselves with Perfect segue for the next question. <laughs> so when we talk about ed tech, it's usually geared towards the students. And I want to hear about the other side. What does it look like for the teachers, Sheikha Latifa? Yeah, absolutely. So just very quickly about this, um, the previous question. Um, I think what's, what's really awesome and, and what I'm most excited about right now is can you imagine these kids for the last two years being able to navigate online learning the kind of skills and learning that they will that they have already acquired and I, I, I see this firsthand with my nephews right they're nine and seven respectively the kind of learning that they just went through in the last two years that is going to position them fantastically well for what's what's coming so no amount of you know <laughs> money or anything can actually give them that kind of you know experience firsthand. Um, doing the project-based learning, you know, like Shireen was saying, you know, this is something that we advocate for early on. You know, building on that online portfolio when you're you know when you're ten or when you're twelve. So knowing firsthand that this is what is expected of you when you're ten. Just imagine what it would look like, you know, when you're 15, 16, uh, either applying for work or even creating, you know, your own uh, business and employing others. Uh, so that's that's the first thing. But going back to your question, um, Lana, about uh, teachers. Absolutely. So what we saw at, uh, a clever play is that initially when we started out, it was primarily geared for children and we used to run the programs for them. We saw uh, a, an opportunity in COVID and that when we used to run our STEAM programs in schools, we used to always hear from teachers that, you know, they can't do it. They don't have the background, you know, they don't have the certifications, they don't have the time, uh, to, you know, to, to do it. And we thought, okay, well, what if we were to take, you know, the content that we have developed over the years in-house and that has been, you know, two times STEM certified and give teachers access to this and to really democratize, if you will, STEAM education. Because as Shireen was saying, we're talking about, you know, the non-visible skills, critical thinking, problem solving, problem finding, uh, curiosity, imagination, creativity, these kinds of skills that regardless of what you end up doing in your life are gonna be you know, valuable life skills that will for sure give you that competitive advantage over robots any day, any day, any day, right? So that's really, really important. 
Now, what we ended up doing was saying, okay, well, what if we were to give teachers anywhere access to this curricula and train them to run our programs as effectively in their own locations? And we did that. We did that with, you know, with schools in the United Arab Emirates. And they started running our programs. We trained them completely virtually. You know, the platform has training available you know, on demand. So if they want to go back and see it. But it has been absolutely pivotal because what they ended up seeing for themselves is, okay, I understand that my role can actually change with the kind of programs that we offer because it requires the teacher to redefine how she sees herself or how he sees himself. You know, not as, you know, the sage on the stage, if you will, but on the facilitator on the side. And so they had to reimagine what their, you know, what their role in the, you know, classroom looks like. And so the platform was completely built for teachers because we understand, you know, that they have very limited time. They have very limited um you know, just like they want to go in, they want to have access to the curricula, they want to watch the video uh, guided resources to get an understanding of what the projects or the themes that they're going to be doing and the resources that they're going to be printing out for the kids. So the UX design has been done primarily just for the teachers. But as you rightly pointed out, you know, usually it's, it's a one-way conversation when we look at it, you know, just from the student's point of view. Equally, we have to make sure that the teachers are also upskilled to meet that demand and meet that meet that challenge. Thank you so much. All right, I'm just before we move on to the next uh, the last two questions, I'm gonna ask uh, our audience if they have any questions to get them in, so we get enough time to actually answer them. So now's your chance. Write the uh, the questions in the Q and A, and we'll we'll take a look at that after we're done with these two questions. Uh, this one is for the lovely Amira. I've heard that the UAE has a national reading strategy, and I was curious if Al Rawi had any plans to do something similar in Bahrain or the region. Are you prepared for something like that? Hi. Uh, let me let me first comment on Sheikh Al uh, very very beautiful speech. Uh, I actually very, very agreed on, on the point where the teacher should be fun uh, because uh, I, I see that with my kids. I have uh, 11 and six years old. Uh, actually, the Arabic teacher were uh, telling, um, showing that al khamis al wanis today is, and she loved that session. She She's like, when is it, uh, Thursday? Because I, I want to see that that point. It, to that, to that, it's very small thing, but it's, you know, it, it teaches them a lot. And I agree also on that. You how much money you put that they will don't learn what they did now these days. Back to your uh, questions. Uh, uh, yes, we do uh, have planning. And we are talking with different uh, governments and entities, um, you know, but it takes time for these th big things. Um, and we're trying uh, to, to fill that gap. Um, we need the help of the governments and entities uh, to give us the support to, to do that. Um, as uh, Mr. Abdul Aziz mentioned earlier that the students these days, they are not actually teach the, how to be entrepreneurs when they graduate from school. We have in a row, we have 15 minutes books, uh, the best seller summary of books that they teach these students how to market their products, for example, or how to make a simple finance program to start your thing. So when we do all uh, gather with that thing, uh, I guess it will be something big. Uh, it will help uh, the publicity of reading and educating in the same time. 
Inshallah, I, I hope so. This is a, a big conference, so maybe someone hears your call to action. One, one teaser, we are working now with uh, one of the GCC. We are not allowed to, to say which country. For a big thing, it will be on the roads and, and everywhere, inshallah. So it will launch. All right, Michelle. okay. Last question down the line. There is a, an interesting law called Amara's law, and it says, and I love this, uh, we overestimate the impact of technology in the short term. So over, uh, overestimating it in the now, and we underestimate it, the effect of it in the long run. So I'm curious to know what technologies are you excited about that might revolutionize or game changer the ed tech sector in your specific sub industry? Shireen, would you like to go first? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, it's very exciting anyway to see how AI and VR and the such will further uh, disrupt and revolutionize ed tech. But I think that the most important thing to remember is that, again, like Sheikh Latifa mentioned, these are mediums, right? Like the, they, it's, it's all about how you use them. How do you create the learning experience? Uh, a lot of times, people, uh, some people make the mistake that if I throw more technology, uh, more AI, chatbot, gamification, uh, on these elements, then here you go. I have a disrupted model of technology-based education or edtech-driven uh, program that is engaging and exciting. And that's truly not um, what this is all about. The, 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 the effectiveness and efficiency of an edtech program lies in how it serves the needs of its, its learners, leveraging technology. So I'm all for thinking about learning engineering, cognitive science, psychology. How do you bring all of these together when you are using technology and uh, keeping in mind the stakeholders you have. So for example, even though I run an online learning platform, I do not always advocate that, you know, it, online education is the silver bullet for all education challenges we have, or that across the board, 100% online learning is always what's needed. Sometimes you do need to have that in-person component or a blended approach when you're talking about, for example, K to 12, uh, because we know that the psychosocial aspect of the experience matters a lot. So, I mean, there is no one size fits all. And uh, we, um, the, the innovation and uh, let's say creativity in how we use technology to deliver engaging learning experiences is all about the choices we make in bringing together these different elements and leveraging what we have. But for sure, going back to the specific question about uh, technology itself, I think with the rapid um, changes we are seeing, VR is poised to offer a whole new dimension that's going to be very exciting and immersive uh, when it comes to EdTech. I was muted. Uh, I, I already know your opinion on this, but I'm going to ask you anyways, Sheikh <laughs> Latifa. Honestly, I think Shireen, again, she, you know, I, I resonate with everything that you said 100%, 100%. Um, I believe, I bet on the human brain, right? I bet on the human brain. And um, I believe that, you know, the future belongs to the learn it alls not the know it alls <laughs> And so, yes, well, there's so much technology out there that is super, super exciting and, the, and that will really be game changers. But at the end of the day, I'm more excited about, you know, how these kids or these youth are going to use technology to go and, you know, create some amazing things and make, you know, make it happen. So that's where I'm, you know, I'm most passionate is to be able to put the tools in their hands, you know, give them the skills required, use the tool, use the technology as a tool to create something fantastic and amazing and impactful. Fantastic. Amira, what do you think? What's the game changer in your industry? Um, I mean, Technology has no limit, right? Uh, 
we are now working on uh, letting the audience to contribute in Arawi through their own phones. Uh, yeah, so that they will make it more easier uh, to no need for studio or microphones or anything. A, a content creation strategy. I like that. Fantastic. And Dr. Sheikha Fay, what do you think? Right. Well, I'll, I'll just speak from another perspective, from a governance perspective, I'd say, since uh, hence being at the University of Bahrain, I think one of the biggest technologies in edtech to look at is data analytics, because we would want to know uh, not only how students are learning or what do we, they need to learn or what, what is hindering their learning. We want to connect all these three together. So um, it would be great in the future if data analytics would help us in knowing if a student misses two classes, why are they missing the classes? Is it because they are late in their registration? Is it because something else happened in another class? Is it because they're not meeting their advisor? These are all information that we can all, these are all dots that we can connect using data analytics to help us make better decision-making for educational processes. So from a governance perspective, I think uh, large institutions, large educational institutions, such as the university, like the University of Bahrain, would benefit a lot from a very strong data set and a very powerful data analytics tool that helps both the instructor, the head of the department, the dean or the university administration overall to take the right decisions about students. So we would want to know um, which students have lower GPA and why are they having lower GPA and what skill sets are they missing before they graduate. These are all things that we can uh, know in the right time and prevent in the right time if we had the right data analytical tools that enables us to make those decisions. So I think data analytics is the thing to look for in, uh, in the education sector in the future. Fantastic. I, I This has been really engaging and inspiring. Um, if there are any questions from the audience, you can write them now. I think that we've probably engaged them enough <laughs> for them and maybe even answered all of their questions. So I'm going to um, invite any of the panelists to ask another panelist a question. Is there a panelist that wants to ask a burning question to another panelist? And then we can end the session and continue with the good work that we do. Yes, actually, I do have a question. <laughs> okay, I'll just, um, thinking about um, the effects of online education and online working and online skill uh, acquiring, uh, basically for both uh, Amira and Shireen and, uh, and also for Sheikha Latifa. Uh, there are also negative effects that we are getting, especially for um, young children, I'd say maybe this is directed to uh, Latifa, in terms of their social ability to contact with people. And also for us adults, you know, having those burnouts from, you know, continuous online sessions or lacking this, um, you know, one-to-one -one small conversations that makes the day brighter. I would uh, just want to know from their perspective, um, what do they think can be done, especially for young uh, adults? Um, I have uh, witnessed uh, teenagers who uh, have now came into episodes of um, anxiety and, and when they are meeting actual people face-to-face -face after a very long time of just meeting them in screen. Uh, young children who are coming back to school now after a, um, not in Bahrain because we've been having on and off, but uh, for example, in, in Saudi Arabia, where they have disconnected for complete two years, and now they're just coming back to the campus. So there are episodes of crying of young children who do not want to meet other people in, in person. So what do you think um, is, um, is the solution for that, for a long two dozen time of online education or online work and then suddenly coming back? How do we solve this, um, this equation? If I may ask that question. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Let's start with Shireen, what do you think? So that's a very interesting question and I'm very happy that you brought this up as we wrap. Oops, we lost her. Okay, all right, let's let's go to Latifa while we get her back. 
I'm happy. I'm happy to jump in until uh, Shireen rejoins. Uh, but you know, <laughs> funny enough, you know, we're talking about technology, and the internet decides to fail us today. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, again, this is this is something very, very important, and it goes back to you know social emotional learning and social emotional being, and that's you know schools right now. There, you know, many many of the schools have prioritized this. To understand that, you know, especially for children, it's it's very, very important for you to understand that, yes, it is very tough for them to, you know, navigate the online world, which is completely different to in person. I remember when we first started doing online learning, one of my nephews, he's he, he was four at the time. And uh, when, you know, when we said, hey, by the way, like, you know, you're starting, uh, he, he, he was supposed to join KG and he did it online. So that was his first experience of school was online. And so he was like, that's not school. That's a computer. That's a screen. But, you know, sorry, Shireen, I just jumped in until you came back. So I'm just going to finish no, my please, point please, and I'm, I'm going to have the mic over. I'm having trouble with my connection. No problem. So, yeah, so this is what it is you know it, it came from a from a kid who understood that by the way like this is not school this is a screen but to your point you know I think we have to prioritize social emotional you know connections and learning because at the end of the day it's 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 a huge component of learning and, and the effectiveness of learning if, if that in and of itself is not plugged in then how can you possibly make sure that you know everything else is is taken care of as well so um, prioritizing that is, is really important. And then also, you know, for, for moms uh, out there who have children that, you know, that um, may, have, may be facing these kinds of things, I would say um, just, you know, making sure that you're also doing everything in moderation, right? So making sure that they, they do have time to do things outside of just screen time. Although also to be, you know, to, to give you another perspective, uh, there was a study that was done about the importance of uh, gaming uh, and, and how gaming can actually help uh, children who may not be, you know, very comfortable speaking to, to kids in person, but giving them that opportunity to play games online in collaboration with others actually saw an uptick in, you know, how they would speak to others online, et cetera, et cetera. So it's especially now when we're talking about digital natives, and I can tell you for a fact, I see this with my nephews. They don't make the switch. They like everything for them is, is like online and, and, and in person is more or less the same. So if they're connected with someone online, they don't consider them as their online friend. They just consider them as their friend. And they would talk to them the same way that they would talk to, you know, an in-person. It's, it's astonishing. It's, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm learning as we go. But, you know, I do have to point that out. But uh, Shireen, I really hope your internet um, sticks through because I was very interested in hearing what you had to say. Go for it. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so my experience has been with kids, obviously, as a mom. Uh, and I, I've seen that there's this tension when it comes to screen time that, you know, if I'm doing online learning, then I can't watch my half an hour of YouTube or TV. And it's kind of, uh, for them, uh, depressing. And also there's this fatigue from the presence in the online class because day in, day out, they're just seeing reflections on screen, right? They're missing this connection, playing with, uh, their friends. So I did see the effect on, for example, my son on how months later, uh, at the beginning, he was very excited. He would stay in his PJs. It was cool. But then, you know, months later, he started missing that connection. And when we started doing the rotation, I felt that this was like the sweet spot where we are keeping safe, but at the same time, also creating these opportunities where they are engaging. There's a lot of research that's coming now, out now about um, the effectiveness of, uh, you know, if you read a book or you read online processing, how does it happen, retention, comprehension, and the effect of engaging with the screen all the time. Uh, for adults, 
learners where I'm more exposed to when it comes to my work, I can only I can also say that um, they have seen a great opportunity during the pandemic to use their time uh, wisely by going to online learning. Uh, and because it's informal learning, you don't have to do it within a certain framework and you have the flexibility, it was uh, you know, less of an effect on their mental health and uh, the way they were interacting with our programs. But we all hear it about the Zoom fatigue, about even in the workplaces, the need to connect with your peers um, and your colleagues to forge these personal connections. And that's why going back to what uh, Sheikh Hafei was saying, do you ask people to actually turn on the camera or not? One side of you wants to respect privacy, but the other, you know, you're saying remote work is here to stay and it's really awkward <laughs> to speak to a screen or see your reflection on the screen. It doesn't really, and you know, nonverbal cues and communication is very critical. It, it makes a lot of difference. So I think these are all new norms that we are adjusting to and they are slowly becoming the no, new normal and we're figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, but I think that it's all about not trying to replicate what we do traditionally and just replace that component of the lecture with broadcasting uh, a speaker who shares things. It's more about like what Sheikh Latifa was saying, but how do you facilitate an engaging learning experience? And um, honestly, any education system is just as good as its teachers. So they play an important role while putting the learner at the center of the learning process, but it's also the educator who is the orchestrator of this entire learning experience. Beautiful. And finally, the last question of the day again, uh, Amira, what do you think uh, for Dr. Sheikha Fay? I'm sorry, <laughs> get confused, too many. <laughs> it's all right, just pay, Amira. Thank you, Lena. Right. Sorry. Uh, so, um, what, what do you think could be done about like screen burnout and you know the depression that's coming from people from spending too much online? Is there anything you've noticed with your uh, your your audience or in your industry? Um, actually, it, it was very good with us. Uh, I, or every time I, I say I love COVID-19 <laughs> because it's come with, with many audience for, for us, especially with the publishers. Uh, they connect with us through the, after the pandemic and before it was like, no. Um, um, I seen that from my relatives and colleagues that some of them, they did not like uh, um, the uh, online, especially when they are like fairs, when KG1 or fairs here of university, because for them, it's just um, a laptop or a computer, as um, Sheikh Latif mentioned earlier. Um, from my experience, um, I saw that my kids are interacting with that more. I have two shy kids. Uh, they don't stand and talk in front of a teacher. But with the, uh, with the uh, online learning, um, I saw my kids stand and present for 15 minutes, which I was like, whoa, is that Jude? And, and the teacher sent me that, see how Jude is now connecting with her peers because she's uh, on, on, on the screen. And I was like, it is gonna be uh, on the class also. And when they open, um, she said, yes, it's exactly the same thing. She practiced home uh, that's on the screen. And when they go back to school, she is herself. She's like, yeah, I know these people. And uh, I already speak in front of them. So it's, yes, I am totally agree with Sheikh Latifa what she said earlier. It's you I'm, um, who, who use that technology. It, it's you who uh, make it depression or, or not. Interesting. Yeah. And, I, and the individual, I mean. I, I never thought of it that way, but that does bring up a really valid point that some people could use yeah. it to their 
advantage fantastic they have more friends now yeah they have more friends they they play all the time um even if they are on uh, offline uh, they trying to say we we played that uh, game with the with our school friends um i mean for a uh, six years jude doesn't have only one or two friends she's now having 15 or <laughs> you know what i mean yeah fantastic great and we are just coming up on six o'clock. We had no questions. We had answered them all between all of us and the diverse questions and everything that we've spoken about. We could write a book <laughs> and we're done. I think we've covered just about everything. Ladies, you have been amazing. Thank you so, so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to end this meeting for all. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Shana. Thank you.